welcome to 2022 R1. I hope lots of you have got it installed already and are enjoying its, its features. Um, we'll, um, we'll go through it in groups of subjects. So let's get going. So one of the big things recently with ANSYS Fluent has been on usability. Um, many of these things I'm just going to flick through, but it's really important, I think, to let you know certain things are happening or have been done. So one of the things you'll notice is it's going to be much, much faster for larger cases. So the GUI can slow down to a slug or used to when um, you had lots of cells, lots of faces, lots of solids present. There's been some massive reductions. Um, in time required to do things and set things up. There's a couple of changes to um, the embedding of windows. So you're able to um, embed a window inside another one now. So for example, you could have a, an image of the um, pressure field showing up as you solve and it's showing that. Well, you could, for example, embed a, a graph of residuals. And the way that that embedded information is kept in that is now um, improved. There's a, a small change, but one that lots of people have asked for is that a lot of people want to make an animation, say, during a steady state run, just to see how the flow is going and make sure that they've got everything set up right. So you can now make those animations live to the screen and just have a storage type of none and um, it will just disappear when you're finished. There's been work to improve um, your ability to have multiple views. So when you set up multiple views in Fluent, you can now synchronize them. There's a short movie here that I'll play. So you can go down, click on the lock button. And once you've locked that, now all these views are locked together. So. Um, and you can synchronize all windows or some windows. Uh, so it makes it much easier for um, exploring certain regions of the model. Um, this is something for people who like to make nice plots. So um, when you want to, for example, render um, the walls with some sort of material, so you might want to make them look made of concrete or steel, um, you can now have more materials and more control over that. It's very intuitive to use. So you can go in there and pick uh, groups of walls and render them or individual ones. Uh, it's very flexible. A couple of new supports for functions. So two, two big ones. So a key one is that now whenever you use an expression, Previously, you could only take, say, the average static temperature on a, on a surface. Now, any object you've created, be it a plane, an isosurface, um, whatever, an isoclip, can be used for this information. So it's much easier now to go around and, and extract data. And secondly, um, you can now create um, force monitors on porous regions. So if you need to get forces uh, acting on a porous region, such as a radiator or a porous block, you can now do that. A few um, uh, ease of use things. So, so one is if you want to find out about your mesh, uh, you can now select a whole pile of, of uh, regions, volumes, cells, and get info on the quality. And then secondly, it's always been possible for a long time to make a nice pulse video, but you would have to do some sort of screen recording to capture that. Now there's a save pulse animation built into this. So you can actually write a, a video file directly. Um, there are quite a few additional modules to Fluent that um, you might want to use. Um, they're not part of Fluent because they have a kind of a specialized user base. Um, 
but um, things like MHD or fuel cells or um, the fiber model, macroscopic particles, reduced order models, et cetera, uh, can now be addressed through the more option here when you're in the toolbar. So you don't have to go into the TUI and load them up. That, that has a, a certain advantage that depending on what type of models you've got enabled, more or, or less of these will be available. So it'll stop you um, having incompatible things set up. Anything that you were doing in the TUI, to, in your scripts, that will still continue to work. What we'll talk now about meshing, and with meshing, there's lots of changes um, of, of features and usabilities uh, issues um, being addressed. That I'll, I've got a significant number of slides now on meshing. So one of them is around orthogonal quality. We know how important it is to have a good mesh. And at 2021R2, we introduced this ability to get more information about it. Um, even with a good orthogonal quality, though, you can still run into problems because there are some sorts of cells that orthogonal uh, quality doesn't capture that are bad. So um, there's a new definition called enhanced orthogonal quality. So it's good because it handles high aspect ratio prismatic poly elements. So these are exactly the elements you get if you're doing a very fine wall mesh when you've got a polyhedral mesh. And um, so they're close to the wall, usually your low Y plus meshes. And if the quality's bad there, that's an issue. Previously, you might not detect that they were bad because of the metric. So what you have to do now for the moment is just issue this TUI command to yes, and it starts using this enhanced orthogonal quality. And when you send this mesh through to Fluent in the solver, it will continue to use that. So um, when you do uh, look at quality or you monitor quality there, you will be using this enhanced value. I'm sure this is just a prelude to this becoming default. I suspect what's happening is they're looking to make sure this is, this is capturing all the things they need it to. Um, there's more support for um, wildcards in meshing tasks. So there's a, a couple of reasons for this, I guess. One is that you, you've got a lot of things to pick with a similar um, name, you can use this. But the other is, if you want to make your template that you generate or your script much more uh, tolerant to changes in geometry, then by selecting via wildcards, you can always make sure that you pick up all the faces that belong to that particular group. So, you know, you've, if you've got a whole pile of labels here, you can do things like anything that's got wheel in it, anything the ends WTL, um, something that has wheel at the start, so nothing before, um, wheel and front appears somewhere in it, um, and wheel and not the word tire. So this just picks up the wheel front and rear, and um, rear and front. So um, it's very powerful for helping you set up um, objects now, like when you want to choose things for boundaries or mesh controls, etc. A couple of new sizing improvements. So it may be that you've got some thin regions here that you don't need proximity on but you do want proximity on in other regions. So you can ignore the proximity in these um, thin regions by uh, setting this parameter refine thin regions to no. So those won't get proximity set, but there'll still be proximity between them. 
And then finally, when you've got things in, um, and maybe the shared topology hasn't done such a great job, and you've got um, two bodies here, and you've got a small, what appears like a small gap there, um, then you're getting a terrible amount of fine mesh here. Whereas if you say you want to ignore that um, across objects, you get the mesh you'd expect. So uh, two very nice features. This is one that, um, again, that's really nice. It's, it's, it's akin to removing slithers. So um, if you bring in a mesh where there's obviously a CAD defect here, it was not intended, but it's a CAD defect, then you're going to have some small, highly skewed cells there. If you only improve the mesh, well, it gets a little better, but it doesn't go away. But if you um, do it down here in a surface mesh improved task, look, you've completely got around that. So the skewness has gone down enormously. So watch out for this. Um, it, it, can be, um, it can be used uh, very effectively. Now, there's a new shared topology method going into here. Um, that um, it will it will connect edges of overlapping face pairs rather than doing a join intersect like it does now, and it's faster. It allows you to um, address cases that maybe you can't before. So um, if you're in space claim, you can go in here when you do the share. You can create contact groups and they'll connect the topology, or you can go in and do it now directly with this new shared topology. So have a look at that. That's um, uh, going to be useful. So those were all for the watertight meshing, which is, which is what most people seem to use who've got reasonably clean CAD. They do a little bit of cleanup and they've got a nice system that you'll notice if you turn on beta features that you can now um, have bodies where you don't have to have everything in one domain so if you um, you have to have shared topology across everything you can have multiple fluids and solids and voids and that currently but soon we'll have the released feature that you don't have to have um, shared meshes at certain interfaces. So I'm thinking of a rotating domain within a uh, stationary domain. Lots of work is going to make this more flexible and adding these sorts of things in. So watch out for the mesher. It's also gonna have the ability to have some swept regions in soon. That's, that's active work. Now, if you've got really complex models or dirty CAD or things, then um, you're going to be bringing in a large set of CAD faces, or you might be bringing in sets of STL geometry. Um, object selection and setting is one big thing. So um, what this um, new features allows to do is to give you better ability to do that um, here. Um, you can have some control over, over creating particular uh, intersection loops. Um, so you can pick some selected faces and create an intersection loop here if you want to absolutely make sure that that's captured. There's a lot of tools gone in for splitting prisms. So what this allows you to do is go in and generate a single prism layer and then split it or take an existing set of prisms and do some splitting on them. So for example, if you want to refine them down closer to the wall, uh, there's tools for doing that. Now, here's a couple of three blocks together. What you can do is add boundary layer to all zones. 
one layer, you set an aspect ratio, this is not going to split, so this just makes them. Then you can add a task where you want it to pick selected zones and split that into five. So um, you split your, your one layer into five layers. And you know you may may not like that as a mesh. Um, you might want to change the aspect ratio or whatever. So you can go in and change that. And you can say don't split. So all you're doing now is changing the distribution of them. So this gives you a lot of flexibility. And you can see in this case, um, it's been done in such a manner that um, you go from thin to thick as a demo here um, using different tasks. So um, this, is, this is a good way of actually getting some high quality inflation on. If you can't get lots of layers around, you might be able to get a couple around and then do splitting. Um, there's a new way in the fault tolerant meshing of creating offset offsets surfaces or boxes. So the idea of this is that you might want to identify a region um, that you want to relate to either offsetting some geometry or building a box around um, around a body. And that you can do now quite easily. So you could do an offset surface around this mirror. So why might you want to do things like this? Well, uh, suppose you've got a mesh and you want to look at the impact of, say, 10 different wing mirrors here on a whole car. Do you really want to do the whole remeshing every time? What if you could put the mesh around this into a box and just swap that mesh in and out? And so that's the sort of thing you can do here. You could replace, for example, this spoiler by having a region defined around it. You can bring the mesh in. Now, you can then go in and you can just um, update the volume mesh, or you could go and update the surface mesh around this area too, depending on what you want to do. So um, again, there's been some significant improvements there in meshing, and um, I really commend to you using the fluent meshing. If you're a CFX user, you can use fluent meshing and export, just use tetrahedral meshes. But all of the good stuff here for making high quality meshes and splitting prisms, et cetera, you can use all of that. And we have a number of users in, of CFX who are actually doing that. So uh, don't be scared to do that. Um, my next topic is rotating machinery. Um, this is quite broad in the sense of rotating machinery. So um, what are the big ticket issues here? Well, I think one of the biggest is a change to turbo grid. So turbo grid is very good at getting structured meshes around blades, which makes for high accuracy simulations. And if you've got things like small fillets and that and tip gaps, you can actually uh, build those in. But what happens if you've got very large fillets or something like this, um, say, uh, propeller, where you've really got um, a whole load of structure around here, you're never gonna get a structured mesh on that. So what you're able to do now is choose um, a, a location along the blade at which you wanna switch from using your structured mesh uh, to using an unstructured mesh. And then you can build unstructured mesh around there. You don't have to take it all the way out either. It's a finite region that it builds in that allows you to do that. And that could be on the hub or it could be on the, on the, uh, the uh, tip here, out on the, out on the shroud. Um, and it builds you this really nice quality mesh. So it's really, really extended the use of turbo grid. Uh, so what we're seeing is a lot of turbo machinery um, functionality is now being moved into Fluent. And 
basic to that is being able to have a good interface between rotating and non-rotating areas and having um, a good mixing plane model. So um, previously, there were a couple, depending on whether you were radially or, ta or axially related to the impeller. So different mixing planes here, different technologies. There's now been um, a lot of improvement to them in a, across a lot of areas to consolidate those and to improve um, conservation across them, to improve um, performance for radial machines. And um, we can actually improve as well the creating of tip gaps. Now I'm going to show you in a second um, where the turbo is sitting actually in, at the moment in terms of setup and that. So here we've got a multi-stage uh, compressor running. Now that could be running the full or it could just be running some periodic instances and we'll see in the thing that it is. It's just running periodic instances. Um, if you're running steam turbines, um, there's a improvement in that you can now use the international uh, standard for water to create RGP tables, which will go in and give you um, the properties of non-equilibrium wet steam. There's a couple of built-in models, um, and um, now this this model. So this gives you the same capabilities in Fluent as you have in CFX now. Um, again, aerodynamic damping. So this is a one-way FSI problem where you look at the modes and see are they going to damp out or not, and um, what is the damping factor. And you can see a comparison here of the damping factor versus the mode, uh, essentially the mode number. And you can see that Fluent and CFX are giving pretty well identical answers. So again, that's another technology that's come across. Um, blade film cooling. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, it's important when you're cooling blades to have the holes for the cooling gas. And CFX has long had models for dealing with this specifically. We've now got those into fluid. So you don't have to um, set a whole pile of inlets here. You can read in tables of holes and it does clever things there to make sure it, it captures the jet and that going out. Um, and um, that is now um, much, much uh, more uh, performant here. And um, it's, it's, it's at a very good state. So um, turbo workflow. And I think this is, this is something that if you want to run any any turbo like a pump or a fan now um, it's really the time to move across and do that in fluent so what you can do here is kick off this workflow and work down it and it's very much like the workflow that there was in cfx or is in cfx for doing this so um, what it does here though is it draws lots of nice pictures as you do things so you start describing the component and you start saying how many rows you want and what they are, and it draws you a picture. And then you bring in meshes, you associate them to those different components, and make all your interfaces, etc. Choose your physics. Um, and what you can also do this for is to automatically create turbo topologies. So things like um, uh, planes between between the blades that you want to have, um, you know, parametrically through there. Uh, and also report definitions. So all the typical things that you might have wanted in a turbo report, you can set up here now. You can switch out of this and go into the fluent workflow. So you might get here and then want to do something a little strange that's not in the workflow. You, you can then go and do that. 
So it's a really nice um, interface for generating uh, turbo setups. And with that has gone a big improvement in the way you can set up periodic instancing. So within that, you're going to, you know, if you're building a machine here, you might want a couple of blades here. You might need a whole row here. You might want five there. You can very quickly uh, set up this, and this will allow you to um, do that very efficiently. So, and then it makes the post processing easy because you can then tell it that you want to post process um, the whole device and then it'll copy. Combusting and reacting flows. We know there's been a few important topics here recently um, that's continued. Now, I think this is a really significant development. Um, so, when you want to include turbulence in combustion, you can either um, do it via approaches like flamelets, or you can do it with something called the eddy dissipation concept, where you think of um, turbulent eddies as little reactors, and that's where you mix and you get your, your combustion going on. There's lots and lots of cases where that basic model performs really poorly in terms of its predictions. And, and they're particularly when you've got mild combustion. So this is this flameless combustion where you're, you've got dilute gases that are combusting at lower temperatures or at supersonic combustion. Um, and we've certainly got users here who found that's not very good. There was a lot of research done out, um, out in universities that came up with this new, what's called a partially stirred reactor. So this is nothing about your geometry. This is the approach that's used within these turbulent eddies to be able to get um, the turbulent interaction with the chemistry done well. And you can see there's some big changes here. So this is mass fraction of oxygen set to different values coming in here, and we're getting different temperatures, and the green and the dots is the new model, the red is the old. So we're definitely getting a lot of improvement. And it, it just performs better anyway in terms of a model. Um, so we can now have non adiabatic strained um, uh, flame that generated manifold. So what that means is that we can do things where there's significant stretching and straining of the fl oh, flame. Sorry, I thought that was a movie. Um, and we see quite different behavior. And it's really important if you want to predict blow off to be able to capture these effects. Um, so that, that's a really important addition to the modeling tools. More work has gone on on hydrogen combustion, particularly looking at flashback. So you can see burning back down there and then suddenly we're burning right back at the entrance. So we've had flashback. Um, important to be able to predict that. And there's lots of work going on in hydrogen. There's also um, looking at more validation. So this is a swirl stabilized flame. And uh, this is some of the prediction. So they're generally pretty good. Um, continuing to work on that. There's an improved uh, NOx kinetics. So, um, Within the model fuel library that ANSYS maintains, or which is part of the like the chemistry suite of tools we have now, um, there's been a revamped model for NOx. And so um, that allows you to get better predictions. So you can see that this is the detailed model here in, in this red. The yellow is much closer than the gray. The gray was drifting off at higher um, temperatures. And that's now a uh, much better NOx model. I've got one slide on Chemkin. Um, those of you who um, have um, uh, CFD um, enterprise licenses get Chemkin as part of the deal now, straight away. Chemkin's always been the, like the gold standard for doing 
gas phase reactions and gas phase and surface reactions. So you can have catalytic reactions going on surfaces, sites, etc. active. It's never in the past been, been um, able to involve liquids in multi-phase. That was an initial release of it in the last round where there was some limited capabilities that those have been improved here now. So there's more formulations for dealing with va uh, vapor liquid equilibrium, uh, more uh, reactor types and that is being supported. So this is being developed really significantly at the moment because it, it really gives you a way to do uh, complex chemistry in multi-phase systems, but for simple reactors, so do it very quickly, because we know that if you go out and do the full CFD of these, it's going to be computationally expensive with multi-phase involved. So um, you really don't want to be improving your mechanism in that in a CFD simulation or doing any reduction if you can. You really want to be getting your mechanisms and everything sorted in this Kemkin models. And when you're happy with it, then doing your CFD. So this is, this is the way um, this is developing. So watch the space. There'll be more at each release now. A quick comment on battery and fuel cell modeling. It's not something that there's a huge amount going on in, in Australia and New Zealand. But for those of you who are interested, I think it's important to let you know that, that this technology is being developed. Um, and it's a big part of the ANSYS profile uh, portfolio here. So physics-based aging models to predict uh, capacity, battery capacity. Um, okay, so there's a lot of empirical models that have been around and are in the code. But now they're starting to do them based on um, chemistry. So you can uh, include lots of more of the chemistry and, and particularly that chemistry that results to aging of the cell. Um, when you come to use these models, they are not much use um, outside of, of Fluent if you've got to run Fluent at the same time. Um, so when you want to start integrating these models into a more system model, then you can't run Fluent Transient. It might take days to run. You need a ROM. So a reduced order model, and there's much better training tools than that now for building these ROMs. So significant um, development has gone into that, and you can see that the ROM is picking up essentially the same behavior as the full CFD. So it's it's been well trained there. Uh, there's now a battery pack builder. So it's okay to have one cell, but that's not how batteries are. They have all sorts of layering of packs and supports, etc. So you can now um, have various bits of the geometry set up and models and then pack them together to form a battery. So, um, and then you can start seeing um, what's going on in different modules, etc. Just one slide on fuel cells. There's a whole one hour talk on this. Um, but what I wanted to, to point out are just like three areas. So one is always the meshing um, is difficult for fuel cells. And here we're showing that you can actually start using the um, water type methodology to deal with the non-sweepable parts and then um, bring in sweepable meshes. We can also do extrudes now in watertight meshing. So you could actually mesh this and extrude those off. Um, so when they're flat sheets, just extrude it off. This can all be done now in the watertight meshing. Um, there's lots of physics going on in these. It's not only gas phase reactions and gas phases on surface, but you've now got all the water in there what happens to water vapor, uh, water that forms into droplets. And so there's a whole new um, set of models and what happens to the water that essentially can pass through the membranes there. And so you've got new equations and models for that. And then finally, I think a key thing is there's always a lot of validation going on. So you can see here some, some good validation um, 
for a voltage current uh, curve. Um, let's um, let's jump on to thermal modeling. So there's a there's nothing particularly new here, just a lot of um, useful improvements. So if you need to, you can bring the um, representation of a PCB board into Fluent. So the idea here is, you know, when you've got all the copper layout on the board and that, and you want to, you want to bring in essentially the thermal conductivity tensor uh, there because you've got um, high and low values because of the uh, relative composition in each volume or, or each surface of the amount of copper, you can import that configuration. Um, you can now have um, transparent inlets and outlets when you're using either Monte Carlo or discrete ordinate. So you can have like a, a door that's open and radiation coming in through it. So you've got this type called transparent now that you can use to um, bring radiation in or let radiation go out. You can have shell conduction with non-conformal mesh interfaces. So that is something which has not been possible before. So um, you can uh, start having um, layers of stuff where you're going to build up shell conduction um, even when you haven't got conformal interfaces. Um, okay. Onto VOF and multi-phase flows. So let's um, see what we've got here. Um, so there are two VOF formulations, implicit and explicit. So implicit is where we're solving the equations implicitly and iterating at each step. Um, and this is generally faster to solve because you can take much bigger time steps. But poor convergence leads you to having um, spurious regions of one phase in the other. So uh, here's a, a gear pump. So imagine that that's spinning round uh, and it's, it's immersed in oil and, and you've got a gas above, oil below. And all of a sudden, you've got all these spurious little knobs of air building up here that are not there because of any physical effect, they're there because of bad numerics. Um, so there's been improvements to this formulation that gets rid of those. And, and of course, a um, byproduct, or if you think about it, the reason for it not being there, whichever way you think of it, is that you get better looking convergence. So particularly for continuity. So um, that's a significant improvement. Now, on the explicit formulation, you're actually jumping forward in time explicitly. So you take your conditions at now and you step forward. And if you step forward with a small enough time step, that's stable and that, that's probably current number limited to less than one or fraction of one. Um, but there's certain cases that don't work very well of those, and um, those um, can be um, a bit of a, a problem. So what you can do now is actually not solve the volume fraction at the start, but at the end. So you can solve other equations first and then solve the volume fraction. And when you've got things like changing boundary conditions, um, in, in a setup, this is actually better. It's got a few um, restrictions, but um, it's, it's a first pass allowing you to do this, so it's a TUI only option, but this is something that's looking really promising, and certainly for some microfluidics applications and that, where you might be having changing flow rates and things and conditions, this would be a good thing to give a try. So there's a couple of things on boundary conditions here. Um, and um, 
this is one that dates back forever. When I was doing Taylor Flow bubble work uh, 10 years ago, we had to write a UDF always to stop your droplet when it gets to the end bouncing back and, and going crazy. And the reason is you need to be able to tell the code that um, use the species, et cetera, or the, or the phase that's heading towards the boundary. And you can do that by from neighboring cell. And in this case, you can see in this bottom one, as, as this droplet approaches the boundary, out it goes. And that's a region where you've actually got a continuous input. Whereas here, these continuous inputs are just bouncing around in an unphysical way. Secondly, this comes in when you've got a rotating flow because you need a, a proper boundary condition then that can deal with that, that, that uh, rotating component there. And this has now been improved. This is quite a specific one, but for those of you who use user-defined uh, scalars, or lots of species transport and things, then there were some residual issues with things not being perfect across parallel interfaces. And this has now been um, fixed up. If you're into, into using the detailed boiling model, so the RPI model, where you're actually going to model all of the like the bubble formation from, from a nucleation site and growth and departure, there's a big problem with mesh independence because as you make your mesh finer and finer, it goes from being in the log law into the laminar layer and your correlations that you need for exterior conditions really want stuff that's out in the uh, log layer. So what you can do now is to put in um, lines that go out from the wall and sample and determine what the Y plus would be at various points and sample like the temperature there that's needed so that you bring back the effective subcooling in the boundary layer, not something that changes every time you uh, refine the mesh. So um, this is quite a significant development and makes that, uh, that model much more robust and and less uh, mesh, mesh dependent. Okay, so moving on to the related area of the discrete particle model and wall films. Um, these go together quite naturally because they interact so strongly. So um, one, one thing that users of this will like is that there's a new type of injection, which is tabular. So if you've got experimental data of frequencies or cumulative distribution against size, you can read a text file into Fluent. You can tell it whether it's accumulated or it's a, or it's a probability density. You can choose whether it's based on number or whatever. And you can then just get this into your calculation without having to fit anything to it. There's been some speed ups here, so um, and and cleaning up. So one is really around input output. So surprisingly, it took a very long time to display the uh, particle injection markers and that on Linux, like up to forty odd seconds for for a group of them here, which has now been reduced to three. So it just improves your your uh, GUI waiting time there. There's been some export improvements for Ensite and just general export as well. Um, if you want to take the data outside of Fluent. And then some really key ones here. So there's been um, big improvements in performance when uh, certain certain conditions. So Previously, um, the way data was moved around in that, you used to have to lock and unlock threads uh, at, at boundaries of, of domains, uh, of, of partitions. 
So they found ways around that, and that's given us some good speed ups here um, with, you know, 15% typically across the board for um, cases, uh, you know, on 32 up to 1,000 cores. Secondly, when you've got a lot of chemistry in that going on, you know that particles need the chemistry data. Um, so they might need the species if, if they're, but the species might have to be calculated, say, from a uh, flame library. So each time you want a species value in a cell, you have to call the flame library and revert it back. Um, now, if you can, if you free populate some mem memory with actually the um, combustion species uh, distribution in that cell, then any particle that passes into that cell has it immediately there in memory. And you can see that particularly on larger setups, this is giving another, you know, even 20% improvement. So these are significant. Um, there's um, also some other improvements that have been found to be really good for gas turbines. Um, and all of this is feeding into um, improved behavior, improved behavior when you've got particles interacting with multi-phase, with uh, steep gradients in a cell, or with Lagrangian wall film particles. So uh, significant improvements there. When, um, when droplets um, inter have, have interact with a wall, um, what, how they behave depends on the wall temperature, you know, whether you're getting rebound or flash evaporation or whatever. Um, and that also depends on the particle velocity or Weber number. Um, there's, there's a new model there which allows to have a bit of a transition zone rather than a, than a switch between spread and, and flash evaporation or splash and evaporation. So it gives you a more realistic model that you can use in, in such systems. For the Ornarian wall film, um, you've now got um, more control over having um, the time marching. So you can do more steps per, per particle iteration and you can control that time step behavior. So um, that, again, is giving us, us more flexibility in, in the wall film solver. There's quite a lot in this, um, this section. So let's get going. So one of the things is a new aero workflow. So um, what this allows you to do is um, set up aero runs and particularly where you might want to do a set of parametric runs as well maybe angles of attack etc and do some specific post processing using a special gui so when you come to the fluent launcher you hit aero here and it will take you into a workflow and it's particularly around these areas of of setup solution settings using best practices and post processing where um, you'll see the big benefits. Um, so um, what you get is a reduced GUI here, which allows you to do specific things um, in aircraft speak, but you can always go back to the full GUI if ever you want. You can switch back between them. Um, and the sorts of things you can do is look at specific components. It works for both the the density-based and the uh, pressure-based solver. You can actually um, do parametric runs. You can uh, make parametric plots, etc. You can script it with Python. So it's a um, it's it's it allows you to focus on basically setting up um, uh, aero simulations, which are, can either be sort of in in the real world or they could be a wind tunnel type domain if you're trying to, to replicate something in a wind tunnel. So um, that I think is, is we're going to see a few more of these come out where the GUI is really the same as the Fluent GUI, 
only you see restricted sets showing up while you're in this, this tool, and then you can jump out to the full capability. So if you're in this area, give it a try. There have been huge advances in the uh, density-based solver. So anybody wanting to do supersonic, hypersonic flow should, should immediately um, register the fact that they need to switch to 2022 R1. I mean, such significant um, changes. So um, one, one key thing is how fluxes are calculated on, on the far field pressure boundary. So a far field pressure boundary is like what's happening a long way from your aircraft or your rocket or whatever. And there you, you, you've got your conditions set and you just want them to be what they are. And this new setting here um, allows you to do um, much better in certain cases here where you were getting really very poor convergence or almost divergence. You, you can now um, switch to this new option and you just get monotonic convergence here. Uh, and that's going to be particularly the case when you've got objects, uh, strong flow interacting with, with boundaries. Um, other things. Um, so this is um, a, the ability to, to change um, the gradient operations. So um, the node-based gradient um, enhancements that were uh, made in the, in the uh, density-based solver, again, we're talking about. Um, there, there was an old version. There were some improvements, which weren't always improvements. And there's now a fully extended improvement. And you can switch those on through the TUI. So those are going to give you, again, much better behavior. This is um, a very exciting development, which at the moment is really designed for high-speed aero, but will we'll come more generally into the code. So there's been a focus over the last few releases about improving the way we do adaption and building in automatic tools. So you know, how do you know whether you want to adapt on a variable, its gradient, combination, scaled or unscaled, all these things. So there are now best practices set up for things like uh, combustion, loft to DPM, shock capturing uh, with the shock, uh, shock indicator. This new one is based around a Hessian operation. And that's really just a fancy way of saying the second derivative. So what it's going to do is adapt to local solution error. So the idea is that most of these schemes have a, a leading truncation error that's going to be proportional to the second derivative. And you can identify where these second derivatives are high, and that's where you're going to have a high error. So you can go in and put your cells there. Um, and so you can start off with coarser meshes and end up with really good refinement where you need it. At the moment, this only works as a pressure, uh, working on the pressure field. Um, but the intention by the next release, hopefully, is to have this work for any variable. So it'll be more useful than just for, for, for some of these hypersonic flows, where it's fantastic at capturing both strong and weak shocks. Um, the two uh, temperature model, which is used in, in hypersonics when you go up in high temperatures and you've got thermal non-equilibrium between the different uh, modes of, of vibration energy and electronic energy, um, had these higher order uh, polynomials, these nine coefficient uh, NASA polynomials set up. Um, they weren't performing very well in the way they were used. There's been some uh, big improvements to the convergence and to the quality of the solution. And this is all enabled automatically by default. So I wouldn't be using this in a previous version. And you can see straight away there's some issues here. Um, the two temperature 
uh, model used to be chemistry free and then then there was a version where you could read in all your chemistry it's now got a series of inbuilt chemistry sets that you can just call up like you can call up methane air um, and all of these are hard coded in there now so that you get the the species and the reaction rates all built up so if you're doing anything around hypersonics in earth or martian air uh, at a far field then then go for these okay so changing topics a little bit acoustics um so this is quite a novel um enhancement here what it we know that we can take data at a point in to, uh, in space and capture temporal data and then do an FFT on it. But what about the opposite? Choosing a frequency and looking how that changes over um, over time as your system moves, so or as your system changes. So that's what you can do now. Under this zone specific averaging, um, there's more, there's, we've been able to do mean and standard deviation before. Now you can do min and max, but you can also do this one, which is a Fourier component. And so what it allows you to do is store data over a run and then build up a picture of what a particular um, wave frequency or wavelength, whichever way you want to think about, is doing. So here's an example of a couple of monopoles interacting. And this is what you're seeing instantaneously if you run this simulation. And this is what you'll get if you look at the different frequencies, because these are, these are pulsing at different frequencies. So this is showing you the pattern belonging to the central one. This is showing you the wave pattern belonging to the uh, offset one here and uh, you're now capturing where those frequencies are so in space um we've got an acoustic sponge layer so this is very much like a um uh, artificial beach that you have when you're doing a volume of fluid with waves so when um acoustic waves reach uh, a boundary you can damp them out. So what you do is you blend the density over this region between its, its, its incoming value and some reference value. So you're typically going to be, be using this at um, inlet and outlet boundaries to, to damp out reflected waves in a very efficient way. And then finally, um, on the acoustics front, we introduced a while ago with the purchase of um, VX Experience, the ability to play sound files. So you could record sound data and um, play it back and hear what the sound data would like. Um, we know we can transform uh, data from its, 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 its point of generation to a far field microphone using various approaches in Fluent like the Fox uh, Williams equation. Um, ANSYS have now been working with this code VX experience, which has been rebadged or renamed as ANSYS Sound. And so it can still obviously do those playback of files. But what it can also do is um, taking data from different sources and sending it off to different receivers, etc. So it can do that. Um, propagation um, based on generated files uh, to different locations and that. So um, that's something to have a look at if you're doing sound stuff and you want to understand what's going on with um, generated sound from different sources or, or, di or at different receivers. Okay, so I've now got just a um, a um, group of, of various uh, things that um, I want to um, just go through and mention so you can see 
uh, some, some minor things that might be relevant to you. So we all, we all know about um, when we use the coupled solver, the concept of having a pseudo time step. It's been part of a coupled solver technology for ever since it was done. Um, you can now um, start using this technology with the pressure-based solvers here when you've got something like simple active. So when you're using one of the segregated solvers and you can think of it as having like a local relaxation factor in every cell if you use it based on CFL numbers. So just like you can, you can use this Corot based uh, determination of the time step when you're using uh, a coupled solver, you can start to do that now here. And it's, it's giving you some, some really good um, convergence behaviors here. So um, worth a try. When you make mesh interfaces, you can now adjust the tolerance um, and you can have a bit more flexibility um, when, you, when you generate them. So they've just, just some improvements there. Unified remeshing. So this is an exercise that's going on at the moment to improve remeshing. If you go back to an older release of the code, you'll find that when you switch remeshing on, you seem to have to put in an enormous amount of uh, information to get it to work. Um, what they've been doing is putting the best practices in as automatic and giving you very uh, few choices needed when you set up it basically with a few advanced ones. and. Um, Keep in mind at the moment, this does not include polyhedral cells, but if you're not using polyhedral cells, then there's some really good technology in here now for improved remeshing with your prism layers on surfaces um, and also with size field improvements. So imagine you're doing a simulation of um, a ball flying through the air in a, in a moving mesh, then you would probably start off with quite a coarse background mesh and a nice refinement around the ball. If you don't do anything special and start remeshing, that refinement stays where it is in physical space and the ball just goes out into coarse mesh and when it's remeshed, it stays coarse. What this size field improvement does is allow the code to capture the size fields around an object and move them with the object so that the good quality mesh around the object just moves with it. So um, that, is, that is a really good improvement there. Obviously, this needs to move to polyhedral and it's ongoing work, but there's some really significant improvements if you're using TAT and PRISM mesh. Just by way of reminding you that there's intrinsic FSI capability with Influent. So there's a, there's a, there's a mechanical solver for linear elastic um, materials, and um, you can do things like bimetallic strip behavior, uh, one way and two way FSI. Um, there's been some improvements in that there's a couple of UDFs been added to do things. Um, you can also use expressions. So the, you would need to have a really complicated movement if you wanted to use a UDF, but they're now available. There's been work done on gap modeling. So um, when the gap gets really small, there's one way of dealing with it is to close it up completely. Um, another way is to um, use what's called a, a fictitious viscosity method where your viscosity goes up in that region and um, it essentially blocks the flow off. So um, you've got a, a small gap there because you can't mesh, uh, you need it for the mesh. Um, so what you can do now is have it build a um, 
high viscosity region that essentially blocks it off. And it's, it's got a whole load of tools associated with it now where you can actually choose the region, you can extend it to give it more or less region over which it blocks. Um, and that, so for anybody dealing with small gaps that they might want to close off or uh, restrict the flow through, there's some, some good improvements. Um, this is just going back to the very beginning of where we started, if you like, today almost, in this new orthogonal quality um, uh, methodology. So um, what you can do is, is this new option and uh, poor mesh numerics of orthogonality enhancing cell centroids, hit it yes and set a quality. And that doesn't use the orthogonal quality, it uses this new orthogonal quality here and improves things. So um, you can see here is a case that's going nowhere and a case where once you've done this, it's all improved. So again, this is just tweaks where you move the centroid around in the, in the mesh cell to give that cell a better performance when it's discretized. If you've got um, two and a half D meshes, so if you like a, a surface mesh here, which is extruded depth wise, then there's some improvements to the parallel behavior partitioning here that's gonna give you um, improvements. And um, you can also um, improve it by having some, some uh, this Laplace partitioning option, which um, can give you improved behavior, and you can have that switched on under preferences. If you've got multiple reference pressures, then, um, so you've got isolated flow domains, then there's some big improvements to memory and time. Okay, I think this is our last main topic now, um, and quite an interesting one on optimization. So what this is about is optimizing um, the constants in the gecko model to be able to um, do better against a set of data. Now, you've got a number of ways you can do that. A fairly basic way is to say, um, okay, I know the lift and drag of this, this wing section. I'm gonna change my constants until I get about the right value. And then I'm gonna use them from now on for later designs. But the beauty about Gecko is that these could be locally tuned. So how would you how would you go about that? If you have a certain type of geometry here, then you can go away and run an LES or um, or, or an SBES or whatever simulation and get um, good results. You can then run that steady state in Gecko and. As you can see, we'll take this example. We've massively overpredicted the flow separation here and the lack of recovery. So that's not going to be good. But we can take those um, data from the LES and use them to optimize a set of constants that are varying locally to get that. And it's done via a uh, a, a, a neural network type training. Um, and so what you're able to do then is get this trained and then you can use this um, train model for similar um, flows. So um, you can see in here that um, what you can do is, is take the um, for this particular case, you've got experimental data that you can also use within this process and you can get um, a gecko default, which is not too bad, but then you can augment it with this training and really get a spot on solution there. So this is all pretty new. I watched a one and a half hour lecture, I think, on how to set this up and do it. It's largely all done through the GUI. 
It's something that's being integrated into Fluent as a tool. And it's something that things like F1 teams are making use of already. So um, it is a significant um, methodology that we can have here. Um, finally, uh, an improvement to the adjoint solver is if you want to do anything, uh, optimize something with um, periodic structure, you can now tell the adjoint that it only needs to, uh, it can only deform these so that they remain periodic shapes. So obviously improving a fan geometry is no good if the nine blades, they're all different. So you can improve uh, based on that job geometry having to remain periodic. And the, um, the, the reach out flux algorithm that this distance based one that was introduced a while ago to improve um, pressure velocity coupling is now moved forward into the adjunct solver. So that's regular fluent. Um, I've got a couple of exciting slides to show though on, on, on something that's actually uh, available now as a beta. So when you open up Fluent, uh, you'll see that um, beta features is an option under the GUI and I'll, I'll, I'll open up one in a second at the end to show you. Um, what, what comes up in that now is that there's a, a multi-GPU solver. So this is a new technology being developed to run on a GPU. Um, and at the moment, it can run across single or multiple deep GPUs with shared or distributed memory, subsonic compressible flow, it can be ideal gas, material with constant properties. For turbulence, you can either have K, K epsilon or gecko. So, so um, gecko gives you a variety of models instantly. You can have um, conducting uh, solids and you can have porous media. So, you know, it, there's a reasonable amount of physics in it. Now, what's the idea is that you get the benefits of a GPU solver because you can run on hardware um, that's uh, cheaper to buy and lower power. So, so lots of um, companies are investing now and looking at the multi, multiple GPU solutions and you get really strong scaling in it. I'm not um, up and familiar with all these different GPU um, uh, types, but you know you, ne you need a, a substantial GPU. This is not one that's just running the graphics on your laptop, but once you, you get into those, you can have um, really quite amazing performance. So you've got one of these um, these GPUs here is is giving you an equivalent to 640 uh, uh, cores on five nodes, for example. So, and the parallel efficiency is really good. So watch this space that will be developed. It'll be more physics will go into it, obviously, at the moment. It's good for aerodynamic type simulations, heat transfer simulations. Um, there's no multi-phase, no chemistry or anything. But if we just flick back, it's really quite open here. So if you've got access to GPUs and you want to um, give it a shot, then it's there and it's working. So. That's my update for this year. Um, it's, it's, um, we've got 10 minutes left. I'm just gonna use that 10 minutes to quickly bring up Fluent and um, just show you a couple of things that will show you where certain things are going. So um, I've opened it, but let me just do that again. It was too quick. This is the launcher. Um, this is where you show beta features, um, and yeah, that's so. What it tells you is you're just turning on beta features in the here, not on Influent. So depending on what you've got, if you've got a pro license, you just get Michigan Solution. If you've got premium, you you get the workflow for Aero. That's part of the premium solution. And then if you show beta features, 
you get an additional one here, which is post analysis. So this is a simplified um, uh, access, if you like, to insight. At the moment, it's really there to show you what's coming. It's not something you can make big use of, um, but it's something that you might want to have a look at. I can quickly uh, start, if you like, and just show you what it's going to look like. So, you know, this this looks like fluent. Um, and if I if I read something in, read a data set. So I could bring in, I don't know, those, so I can load them. So this is bringing in, at the moment, just an ordinary case. Um, but, um, yeah, don't, don't worry, my licenses are going to be replaced soon. It's, this happens to be just a bubble column that I've got um, that I'm working on. But you can see that here to do things, it's just like being influent. So I could do static pressure on a surface. I could do the wall. And display it. So at the moment you say, well, why wouldn't I do that in Fluent? The answer is I could, but what it's going to allow us to do is to work through time step animation. It's going to allow you to bring multiple cases in to do um, case comparison. So um, that's, that's something on the way. Feel free to look at it to get a feel for what's coming, but don't judge it as a complete product because it's not. So let me, uh, I don't want to save a session file, I don't care. Um, let me open up Fluent again. Show beta features. Now let's quickly go through to Enterprise. So if you've got an Enterprise license, you get what we had before. You get FENSAP ICE, which has been here for a while now, as a um, Thing. You get that post processing. You get this GPU based solver. There's also um, some of um, Polyflow is in here as when it says material processing, that's some of the Polyflow models. And there is a Lattice Boltzmann code that um, Fluent, uh, sorry, Ansys have been playing with that's there as a beta too. Um, so if you want to open that GPU based one, um, let's just start it up and see what happens. I'll just drag it across again. Here. So this is looking very much like um, what you'd see anyway. Uh, you can bring in a case and data from a setup in Fluent, and that's probably the way you would use it at the moment. If it's got uh, stuff in that this doesn't support, it will tend to try and pull it out. Um, but you're probably best if you want to try something out, set up the job in uh, standard Fluent, read it across here, and then you can give it a try. Um, obviously, make sure you've got a decent GPU to try it on. Um, but all of these tools have got the same look and feel about them. So I'll just I'll just quit out of that and I'll just show you one more because um, I think one of the tools that we have at Ansys, which is um, woefully underused, is is Polyflow, and the reason it's woefully underused is because it's not very pretty to use. So if I start this up, again, bear with me. We come in here and we can start doing stuff. So we've got a limited set of things that we can do here um, because it's got different physics in, but then there's some wizards to set things up. Um, 
So first of all, I've got to specify a mesh. Uh, so I'm not going to do it now. But um, what you can do in this is, is deal with viscoelastic fluids, um, extrusion, etc. So very, very powerful models, um, just not very nice GUI in native, native polyflow. So you can see here what the aim is. When you've got um, what we're trying to do is consolidate all of these various tools in a very similar GUI, and you'll have options when you launch Fluent here to not only launch standard Fluent, but to launch some of these other tools as well.